we are live now all right uh, welcome everyone today for today's uh, online master class session for family physicians i uh, organized by srcc children's hospital managed by narayana health uh, i am dr avisha consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon one of the moderators for today i'd also like to introduce my co moderator dr pooja mehta who is a pediatric neurologist i'd also like to thank the organizing team srcc children's hospital as well as dr rasik shah uh, who is in charge of the master class as well as our senior pediatric uh, surgeon and also dr sonu udani who is a senior intensivist and our medical director so today's topic is approach to backache in children and today's speaker is dr sambhav shah he is a pediatric and as well as adult spine surgeon who has done fellowships in pediatric uh, scoliosis corrective surgery as well as endoscopic spine surgery so now i would like to over to uh, hand over uh, 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 to him so that he can start today's topic thank you avi thank you for the lovely introduction and uh, thank you ma'am for giving this opportunity to me to present here uh, so good afternoon everyone uh, today i will be talking about approach to back pain in children and i will try and simplify it as much as possible uh, my main aim is that when a child comes to you in your opd in your heavy opd what are the things which we should be looking at what are the things which are red flags and so we'll start off with the basic uh, examination we'll start off with the basic approach and then we'll take it forwards for specific disease conditions so uh, we are all uh, family physicians here and you are the true covid warriors uh you are you guys are not scared to deal with corona with the malaria and the dengue uh, and you you guys have been really fighting absolutely well and and hats off to you all uh however at the same time you guys have the strength to fight this but when you see a child like this coming into your opd and when the parents tell you that my child has back pain or I, he's not moving his leg or uh, something is off with him with regards to his spine and that's when actually we really get scared and it's not because we think that we will not be able to you know manage this condition but there are these 10 family members who are standing behind them you know with the most scariest faces uh, asking you a lot of questions usually if it's an adult we see the wife or the son coming into the opd but when it comes to a child the father the mother the uncle the aunt the grandfather they all are there over there trying to find out what is wrong with their kids and especially today's younger parents including parents like me the first thing when we hear a symptom the first thing we go to is to dr google and that's when these parents they get you know really more freaked out and then they want to know what is wrong with the child and they want the answer from the first person they visit and that is going to be our family physicians so i'm just going to start off with what you should be looking at in this child in your opd where you know you need to really transfer him to a higher center or a specialist or if it is something which you can manage during this covid times a lot of parents are very wary of entering into hospitals or going into different clinics and the maximum trust they have is on in in you so just going to give you a few pointers as to how we can manage them in our opd as well so just to give you two scenarios there is a 8 year old boy and a 12 year old boy now the 8 year old boy says i have back pain since 10 days whereas the 12 year old says i have back pain since many many days both have on and off back pain however the 8 year old boy says that i can still play i go play cricket i go play football however the 12 year old says you know whenever i try to play i get pain so i'm unable to play i haven't gone for my football classes i haven't been playing any cricket the 8 year old boy the parents on ask questioning them they say yes the day he has more homework or the day he, we have scolded him his back pain increases however the 12 year old boy says that you know every night i i go to sleep and i wake up with back pain so just two different scenarios but a lot of things give us answers one is the, the number of days since the pain has been there the type of pain the 8 year old boy is still playing in spite of the pain however the 12 year old boy gets pain whenever he plays he gets night pain so when i see this 12 year old boy i am wondering okay that i need something probably needs to be investigated this child cannot be neglected anymore however the 8 year old boy i can assure the parents to start with i can give him some medications and i can hopefully treat the child just based in 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 the opd so the most important is this is a basic medical school where the history and the symptoms this is what is the most important especially when it comes to pediatric spine pain pain since how many days uh, the duration of pain the type of pain 
whether it's associated with any trauma, are there any aggravating or relieving factors? Is there any fever, or weight loss, loss of appetite? And even in this point, we need to go into the minutest details in history. So even the duration, for an example, a child may come with a one month pain, but he may say, okay, 10 days I have pain, then I was absolutely fine. And now again, since one day the pain started. Or the child may say that continuously in the last 50 days, I've been having pain, which is gradually increasing in intensity associated with night pain. Then automatically it lights my bulb that this uh, child needs to be investigated, investigated further. Even the symptom could be of leg pain. Now that is something which I'm not going to neglect. If there is a symptom that he's unable to walk properly or if he has weakness, then obviously I'm going to uh, investigate this child further. Deformity as a symptom is something which definitely you can handle in the first, at least when the parents come to you, I will explain in my later uh, presentation as to how you can first manage it into your OPD, in your OPD as well. And if it's a significant trauma, obviously I'm going to refer it straight to your uh, specialist. So majorly when we, we talk about back pain, we have mechanical disorders. The back pain could be because of developmental abnormalities or inflammation or infection metastatic or neoplastic disease. And the last is a conversion reaction. Uh, mechanical is what we see majority of the patients, uh, especially in the kids who are about 12, 13, who are more on the laptops. Now they are with the mobiles, their postures, so postural problems, overuse syndromes, and obviously a prolapsed intervertebral disc. Uh, developmental is more of spondylolisthesis or Schuermann's disease or scoliosis or kyphosis, which again, we see majority up to the age of nine or 10 unless it's a congenital. Inflammatory and infectious are something which we more often see in the younger population. So when you have a four-year-old child and the parents complain of back pain, obviously you, your red flag, it's a red flag and that child needs to be investigated. So prevalence again, it's, it's more in, 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 in elder kids. So for an example, 11-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, they have a higher chance of getting back pain, which is more postural or related to the sports, especially in gymnasts. Uh, uh, kids who are doing gymnastics every single day, they have a higher chances of getting lysis and that's what gives them uh, the pain eventually. Uh, so this slide we've spoken about now, coming to once you have uh, got the symptoms, you have gone detail in detail into the history, we come to the examination part. So knowing where the tenderness is, is the most important. A lot of these patients have paravertebral tenderness. That means it's not in the midline, it's more in the, near the muscles. And if a child comes to me with pain since 10 days with more of paravertebral tenderness, I would assume that it's more muscle related, vitamin D3 related uh, issue. However, if it's a midline tenderness, if you are uh, palpating the spinous processes and on pressing say the L3 or T12 spinous process, the, uh, the child says suddenly that he's getting pain, that again, would be a red flag. The gait, the, the minute the child walks into your uh, your OPD, how he's walking, is he limping? Is he walking with his knees flexed? Is he walking with his hips flexed? Uh, this all gives you an idea whether this child should be investigated faster or whether it can be something which you can manage in your OPD on the first day. Obviously, a thorough neurological examination goes without a doubt. Removal of clothes is very, very important. Uh, a lot of uh, parents are very when the patient is a 13 year old or 14 year old daughter, but please emphasize that you need to uh, uh, need them to remove their clothes because you need to look for signs and symptoms. Uh, a lot of shoulder imbalances, abnormal skin, skin curves, this all you will appreciate only if you, uh, if the child is uh, <clears throat> removing his clothes. So for an example, uh, a patient with neurofibroma, when they have caffeolus spots or they have hairy tufts, now all this is going to give you uh, a clear signs that these patients need to be investigated further. Again, small uh, skin fold creases, uh, imbalanced shoulders, etc., cetera, uh, are something which you can easily pick up on examination and then appropriate investigations can be ordered by you itself. One, uh, even before we go to the topic of scoliosis, since we are on examination, one basic test, so a lot of uh, parents come, okay, does my child have scoliosis? They read an article and they, they talk about screening the children, et cetera, et cetera, and they have a doubt. And they come to your OPD asking you, okay, does my child have a scoliosis? The best thing is to do this Adams forward bending test where you ask the patient, you keep him in front of you, you ask them to dive as if they're diving into a swimming pool, go into that position. And when you see an abnormal hump in the back of the spine, that patient could be having scoliosis. But if you see that both the sides, the right and the left side are equal and there is no abnormal hump, 
then you can confidently tell them that most likely your child does not have scoliosis. Please don't worry. One more thing which we always see in pediatric population is when a child comes to us with the knees and the hip flexed. And this is more common in, a patient, in patients who have spondylolisthesis of the spine. So again, if you see a child like this, uh, this child children need to be investigated further. Uh, cannot emphasize less on a thorough neurological examination, especially in children with cock spine. And when the pus is compressing the spinal cord, the first signs are exaggerated reflexes, uh, a clonus. So please, a thorough neurological examination is important uh, as much as the patient's history is. Now, coming to the most important thing, okay, you've explained that you have realized that this child needs something to be done. Now, what needs to be done is... Uh, what kind of investigation needs to be done? Because the parents always say, no, you tell me, what do we do? Do we need to do an x-ray? Do we need to do uh, some kind of a, another investigation? So that is very, very important to know that. So the first and foremost, what happens to us also as specialists is that the patients come with x-rays. Now, unfortunately, these x-rays are all in the lying down position, in the supine position. So you need to emphasize that these x-rays have to be taken in a standing position. All spinal x-rays need to be in the standing position because what happens is when the parent comes back to us, it again reflects back on you. The parent immediately tells us, okay, then why was it done? Why was the radiologist not told to take an x-ray in the supine position? So please remember, anything to do with spine, pediatric or adult, always ask for standing x-rays. If you do see hairy tough or you see caffeine spots or if the patients are asking you for uh, the symptoms are leg pain or if you find any neurological deficits, definitely you go for an MRI scan. With regards to CT scan, bone scan, spec scans, I think uh, most likely the specialist will be ordering them. Uh, once the patient comes to you, I don't think there will be a need for CT scan, spec scan, bone scans for, to be ordered by you. Uh, however, x-ray is. And again, if it's a low frame child, even though the pain is in lumbar spine, please order a whole spine x-ray. We have a lot of facilities in Mumbai now which do a whole spine x-ray. So please order a whole spine x-ray, especially in SRCC, we do have them. So please order a whole spine x-ray, AP and lateral to be absolutely safe. Uh, if you are suspecting that the patient may have uh, a lysis or a listesis, then please do order oblique x-rays also because the lysis you can only appreciate uh, in an oblique x-ray where we see a squatty dog appearance uh, and the collar of the dog is actually what is a breach in the bone, which is a lysis. And again, this is very common in patients who are gymnasts who require a lot of hyperextension and hyperextension is what causes this lysis. So if you have a, have a kid who says, I'm very, very into sports. I play two hours of sports professionally every single day. And if they come to you with back pain, remember to do oblique lumbar spine x-rays as well. Uh, the rest, obviously, is we, as specialists, we will decide. If I do suspect a lysis, I'll be ordering a CT or a SPECT. If I, if I think about tumors, I'll be obviously ordering an MRI, bone scan, etc. Uh, so I think probably uh, these investigations should be left once the patient is sent to the specialist. So starting with just <clears throat> some uh, few conditions which affect the pediatric spine. Number one, obviously, uh, prolapse intervertebral disc and cauda equina, which we all assume uh, is the root cause of any kind of back pain, which, however, is not true, especially in the pediatric population. Prolapse intervertebral disc is very, very rare. We very rarely see it. However, cauda equina syndrome is something which we see, in fact, more often uh, with regards to uh, pediatric population, especially uh, children who are obese. So if you see a short, stubby child complaining of back or leg pain or urinary symptoms, please think about a cauda equina syndrome because these are the typical children who do get cauda equina syndrome. Uh, again, in patients uh, who are uh, quite a lot into sports or were lifting some kind of weights or they have a history of lifting weights, you know, you see a lot of pediatric population. In fact, uh, at least five of my patients with uh, slip disc in the last two years, they said that their elder brother was doing <coughs> weights at home and they wanted to try the same. And that's when they tried to lift 15 kilos. This was a 10-year-old child trying to lift 15 kilos and suddenly he had back and leg pain. Uh, majority of these patients are treated conservatively. Obviously, cauda equina syndrome is completely different. And if the patient has bowel bladder involvement, then we do operate them. However, if the patient has subtle neurological deficits, we still try to conserve these patients. Being the pediatric population, they do very, very well. The body heals very, very well. 
in patients who are obese uh, we need to advise them weight loss and we also need to check for endocrine disorders and obviously promote a healthy lifestyle but majority of patients with a prolapse prolapse intervertebral disc with say a one sided right leg pain generally do not require surgery however the small population of patients who do need we now treat them full endoscopically where this incision is less than 5 mm the patients are going back home after 5 hours we don't uh, uh, remove any kind of the natural anatomy like the lamina the spinous process the muscles are kept the way they are we go from the side of the spine under local anesthesia and we remove the slip portion of the disc so it's a completely minimally invasive spine surgery and majority of these patients do not require any kind of big scars so cosmetically also it is very very appealing coming to <clears throat> the second thing which we treat very very often with regards to the periodic population is uh, tuberculosis of the spine and it's one of the most commonest infections obviously in our country so uh, tb unfortunately it it comes in various forms the, even, even the symptoms are uh, I've, i've seen patients who've come with complete neurological deficits with complete paraplegia with significant back pain at the same time i have seen patients who've been having back pain for the last 3 months which is very very mild not bothering them, them at all but however since the back pain has been there for 3 months that's when the, the parents finally decided okay let's get it checked so it is complete i mean the, i i cannot pinpoint any way that what is the commonest presentation of tuberculosis of the spine okay but however back pain is one of the symptoms which is one of the most commonest symptoms in the, all the symptoms of tuberculosis uh, if you ask me how many patients come with paraplegia the the percentage is very very less probably less than 5% but majority of these patients are complaining of a subtle back pain when they come with a significant back pain then yes it is secondary to a pathological fracture once the tuberculosis has caused a fracture in the vertebral body itself then we see a significant back pain in these patients in uh, tuberculosis of the spine again one of the major issues we as spine surgeons deal with is a post tubercular kyphosis especially in our country where we have a lot of neglected cases of cox a lot of resistant tuberculosis uh, where the patients develop a significant kyphotic deformity uh, and which are more difficult to treat at a later stage and which are much more easier to treat if the patients uh, have come to us much earlier uh, there is i mean with with regards to in general the tuberculosis rule that biopsy is 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 the number one thing uh there is no role of akt uh, start to be started immediately a biopsy is the must the minute you take a biopsy and suspect tuberculosis you start your akt treatment but biopsy is required not just for diagnosis but also to rule out the ndr and xdr tuberculosis and to know the sensitivity uh if i do suspect a tuberculosis even though on the x ray for an example an mri i don't see any kind of a bony involvement or bony fractures <clears throat> bracing is required we give a regular thoracolumbar sacral arthrosis which is tlso uh, the patients need to wear these braces for a period of at least 3 months if you are treating them conservatively surgery comes only if the patients are are uh, having neurological defini- def- uh, deficits or they are going into significant collapse and at these patients i do offer surgeries earlier to prevent a post uh, uh, posterior kyphosis which can develop if this patient is treated conservatively and however the bony collapse keeps on happening and then these patients develop a post tubercular kyphosis uh, so just to give you an example this was a patient with this mri and in this mri uh, it was reported it looks like some kind of a neoplasm or a malignancy uh, this patient had a <clears throat> history of just back pain since 10 days and we were sure this is going to be malignancy however we got a biopsy done and it turned out to be tuberculosis so this is how tuberculosis is behaving you may think it could be everything else except tuberculosis but it turns out to be tuberculosis so tuberculosis as such uh, even when we do a biopsy for malignancy we always send uh, our cultures for tuber- to rule out tuberculosis as well another patient of this patient came to me with uh, she was a 13 year old girl with significant pain uh, she's the pain started off since 2 months which was very very mild and then neglected neglected and suddenly she came with in 5 days with significant back pain and with complete deficit below the l4 file level so she had loss of movement in her foot she had uh, bowel bladder involvement 
and obviously this patient then had to be taken in, in for a surgery. Uh, so in this patient, we did an open D. So as I said again, that when they are neglected and if the tuberculosis also starts destroying the bone, spinal cord compression, the surgery itself becomes magnifold. You need to put in screws, you need to put in rods, you need to put in cages. Uh, however, now just a simple pass without any uh, bony involvement, but even if there are neurological deficits, we do it endoscopically, where we drain out the pus completely through a four millimeter incision. Uh, so it saves a lot for the patient. Uh, this is the, again a patient who developed a significant post tubercular kyphosis. These are the patients who were actually tried to conserve. And they are actually more often they, we see them coming from small villages where they are put on bed rest for three months, six months, and been treated with AKT. Uh, and then they come to us with significant uh, kyphosis. And then they start developing neurological deficits after six months, one year. Uh, since diagnosis. And again, to uh, treat these patients, it's, it's a big surgery, a lot of screws, a lot of cage placement, and unnecessarily we, we make it uh, really difficult. Uh, after tuberculosis, again, something common which we see are, are our disc space infections. Uh, now, these are more common in children than in adolescents. Uh, the isolated disc space infection, especially, uh, which is caused by uh, Staphylococcus aureus uh, uh, bacteria, uh, we see them very, very common. And the first sign we pick up on the x-ray is that the disc space is reduced or there is just mild uh, sclerosis around the end plates. So when you see x-ray like this, where the disc height is reduced in uh, a patient who is more than five years old, you do, do suspect uh, infection. And the reason why this is more common is because in children, the blood vessels extend from the cartilaginous end plate into the nucleus pulposus, which is inside the disc. So the disc has two coverings. One is the annulus, which is outside, and then the nucleus, which is inside. So in adult patients, the blood vessels only extend to the annulus, not to the nucleus. However, in pediatric population, they do extend inside into the disc. And that's the reason why a minor urinary tract infection can easily spread into uh, the disc space and give rise to infection. Uh, these patients also, again, uh, the number one treatment is, is first uh, biopsy. Uh, you get your ESR, CBC, and uh, your blood cultures, etc. And majority of them are treated just conservatively with antibiotics. A lot of these children don't collapse the, the virtual bodies, otherwise they don't collapse. So the chances of having a major surgery is very, very rare. A lot of patients, we also do it endoscopically again, where we get a biopsy and we wash the disc space so the, the recovery is much faster. Now coming to something which again is, is uh, one which is very uh, difficult to treat because uh, for a family physician, uh, just scoliosis has uh, so many different kinds of scoliosis. The treatment itself changes right from the type of curve to the age of the patient, to the time of presentation. There are just too many, too many variables uh, which change the form of management. Uh, but however, what I want to just uh, talk about is if you come, if a patient comes to you saying that my child has scoliosis, the parent comes to my child has scoliosis, or the parent comes to tells you that, you know, my child's shoulder is higher, or why is my child uh, leaning towards one side? These are the first things which we see. And you want to give a few basic answers to these parents just to pacify them. So, uh, because they will be having a lot of questions. So I'm just going to be talking on basis of that. So deformities are basically three types of uh, scoliosis, which is a deformity in the coronal plane. So when the patient is standing straight, they are, they are bent towards the one side. Kyphosis, however, is when you see from the side and the spine is basically like that. Scoliosis is like that in the frontal plane. And torticollis obviously is, is when the neck is tilted to the one side. Uh, frankly, we don't have any incidence with regards to our Indian population. There have not been that many studies that we exactly know what is the incidence of, of scoliosis. However, uh, according to the world population, it's present in two to 4% of kids. Uh, the ratio of girls is much higher, especially after, uh, once they are about the age of nine. And adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is something which we see more often in girls after the age of 10 or nine. And the scoliosis also tends to progress with regards to the girl. So when you have a boy or a girl also coming into your OPD, chances of a girl having scoliosis is much higher. So again, the question comes that you need to tell them to remove the shirt. So 12-year-old girl, you need to ask her 
to undress herself, keep the parents inside with you, but you need to examine the back. Uh, the curve with regards to, you know, again, subtle curves, the parents will ask you, okay, what if I, what do we do next? Can we just leave it? So a lot of patients who have adolescent ectopathic uh, scoliosis, only 10% out of those have progression. <clears throat> so if you see a minor curve in a 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, you yourself can tell them <clears throat> that don't worry. This is not going to progress. <clears throat> you will have a normal, healthy life. When you see a scoliosis in a patient who is 9 years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, also with a very, very subtle curve, just a mild curve, you can easily tell them, you don't need to tell them to come to us. Just tell them, repeat an x-ray after one year, <clears throat> come back to me. However, at the same time, if you see a patient with a curve, a female who still has a lot of growth potential when it comes to it's a 10-year-old, 9-year-old, <clears throat> and the curve is quite a large curve. That means on the x-ray also, there's a large curve. Yes, you need to refer them to a specialist because the treatment protocol will completely change based on a lot of factors. <clears throat> so again, if you are asking for a patient x-rays, number one is, as I said, a whole spine standing x-ray is a must in AP lateral. And you please tell your radiologist also to try and include both the iliac crest because we require them to determine the bone age of the patient. So if you are telling them to get an x-ray, you might as well tell them to remove an x-ray along with the pelvis. Again, because if the patient comes to me without this x-ray, I'll have to again ask her to go in for a re-x-ray. And trust me, these parents are very, very wary to get x-rays again and again. Again, they start talking about radiation, cancer, etc., etc. So to make life simple, when you're ordering the x-ray, ask them to include the pelvis as well. Uh, as I said, again, the risk of progression <coughs> Is, is, is majority low in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Now, one thing which we have seen commonly uh, in our country, especially in Mumbai as well, is that a lot of patients come to us at a very late stage. What I mean is the late stage is a 10-year-old girl comes to us when the scoliosis is, is 50 degrees. Okay? Now, the reason why is she was never ever picked up before. Even the parents didn't notice anything at all. Now, why does this happen? Now, one of the reasons why we feel this is happening is because in India, overall, majority of the girls are, are fully covered. We don't see uh, girls going around in bikinis. In fact, we do see a lot of this scoliosis picked up at an earlier stage in the children who are going to the swimming pool regularly where they are wearing their costumes and then the, curl, the parents notice, okay, there is a change in the curve or there's a change in the shoulder. Uh, we, obviously, in abroad, we do see Parents only coming immediately and saying, okay, one month ago, my daughter didn't have this, but today I am. Because they're seeing them regularly uh, wearing less clothes or wearing sleevelesses, uh, wearing bikinis, etc. But in our country, we don't see that happening. Parents are involved within their kids to a certain particular age, so seven, eight. After that, kids are within themselves. Then they're wearing t-shirts, etc. Uh, they're living in joint families, so the kids go separately in the bathroom and they're changing the parents. So then that's the reason why we miss these patients. And so we we do need a scoliosis screening program. However, in, in fact, in America, they are now thinking that scoliosis screening is not required. But we do feel that in our population, uh, scoliosis screening programs are very, very important, where especially girls after the age of 11 or 10 at least should be start being screened. Uh, for subtle signs of scoliosis like imbalance in shoulders, etc. Even the parents should be told at home that once your children are 10 years old, just once in a while, once in six months, just observe any change in shoulder, observe any change in the, uh, in the skin folds in their back. Uh, and this really saves a lot because if I see a patient coming to me at the age of 10 and if the scoliosis picked up early, I may not be able to make her straight, but I may be able to halt the progression of the curve just by giving her simple bracing or by observing her more often. And if I do see that this curve is progressing faster, then I can offer her a surgery at a much earlier stage. So I've already gone through uh, how the basic thing, but this, because it's so important, just a quick recap, that look at the shoulders for any imbalance, look at for any skin folds, if the head is not centered over the pelvis, if you see any uneven waist, any change in the texture of the skin or leaning of the body to the one side, these are the small things which you can easily pick up. And obviously the adult, uh, uh, the forward bending test, which shows you the rib hump. 
with regards to uh, the x-rays, uh, we, if we are observing based on the type of curve and the age of presentation, either we ask them for six months or generally it is one year. In general, if a patient is there at the age of 9 to 10 with AIS, with a mild curve, we are observing them. But if the curve is above 30 degrees, 40 degrees, we are operating them. If a child comes to me after the age of 13, 14, and if she has grown as tall as her parents, the surgery is not to stop the curve progression. The surgery is only for cosmetic. So if again a patient comes to you at the age of 15, that my child has scoliosis. Even if the scoliosis is 30, you yourself as a family physician can tell them, see, most likely the curve is not going to increase. Nothing to worry. You are not going to require any surgery because those parents must have gone, Googled uh, scoliosis, and they must have found a lot of things. And when you Google scoliosis, the majority you see is about surgery. So they are very apprehensive, and, and you can easily tell them that surgery is not required uh, if the child is 15 years old. However, at the same time, when you see a child who is nine years old, please send, send them to a higher center or a specialist so they can be taken care of. Bracing again, we do it. We do have, in fact, SR, SR, SRCC, we have a whole uh, uh, department for bracing, which has been done for so many years. Uh, so bracing does help uh, the curve progression. It does not correct scoliosis. Uh, that is very, very important to be told to the patient. Uh, however, the only challenge we see with bracing is that this has to be worn for a long period of time. And in a day, on an average, it has to be worn for almost 20 to 22 hours to actually stop the curve progression. And with regards to our country, where we are living in a hotter climate, especially in Mumbai, where it is so humid, a lot of patients are non-compliant uh, to this bracing treatment because they really sweat a lot and they keep on removing them. However, it's a fantastic choice. Uh, for a patient who is 10 years old with a 20 degree curve, bracing is going to be my first choice. So in general, if it's a congenital patient, a congenital curve where a patient is four or five years old and these patients, definitely the parents pick up because they are changing uh, like a zero to two year old age group child, the parents are changing diapers, they are going to notice it. If it's an elder patient also, they are going to notice it. So these patients come to us quite early. Uh, however, we try and cast them, brace them and very rarely we try and operate them. Five to 10 years becomes a, a very gray zone. Even in these patients, we cannot offer a definitive surgery because they are growing. So these are the patients where we need to go for growth rods and, and they are require multiple surgeries. Uh, 10 to 12 year olds, we operate mainly to stop the progression of the curve. Uh, you, if it's a child who's 14 years old also, but she's not had a growth spot, even in this patient, I will do it for stopping the progression of curve. But however, patients after the age of 15, 16, our main aim for surgery is, uh, is more of a cosmetic correction or if the patient is having some kind of symptoms like because of uh, such a significant curve, they're having back pain, muscle issues, uh, uh, breathing difficulties. That's when we operate these patients. Uh, just a few cases. So when if you see her, the patient's skin fold is there. She has uneven shoulders. The right side shoulder looks so rounded as compared to the left side. Uh, the hip is coming out towards one side. And these patients, you know, she was a, a 12 year old a girl with a 40 degree curve. Now my aim in this patient was not just uh, uh, correcting it for the deformity correction. It was mainly to stop the curve progression because I knew that she's not had a growth spurt. She was still shorter than her parents. So she is going to grow tall. And the scoliosis is going to increase if a height will increase. Now for 39 degree curve is going to become 50, 60 degree curve, which is then much more difficult to operate. The risks are higher. So might as well operate this patient at this stage and you get beautiful correction cosmetically as well. Uh, we have navigation as well now in SRCC <clears throat> where the surgery becomes absolutely safe. The screws, which are one of the reasons why uh, they're, they're, uh, if they're not put in properly, they can cause neurological deficits. Uh, the patients can land up with paraplegia post-surgery. And when we rotate the spine to correct the deformity, they can develop paraplegia. So navigation is, is really a boon uh, in these situations, along with neuromonitoring, where we can offer them very, very safe surgery and majority of the patients have no neurological deficits. Coming to kyphosis again, it's a difficult condition to treat, but again, with navigation, with neuromonitoring, even kyphosis of 70, 80 degrees, these patients can be very well treated. So we, and also you get beautiful corrections cosmetically. One more deformity is something called a Schuermann's kyphosis. Uh, which is more common in male child. So when you have a male child which is 14, 15 years old, 
uh, something is like a rounded back or a hump, a rounded hump in the back, uh, these patients also are treated beautifully surgically. Torticollis again has a lot of uh, reasons why and probably torticollis, if it's not because of muscle spasms, if you treat them just for three, four days, uh, this is something which you really uh, need to tell, uh, uh, send them to your uh, specialists. Lysis, as I said, again, it's a breach in the bone, more common in gymnasts, more common in children who are uh, very, very uh, oriented into sports. However, we feel that they are congenital as well. That means the patients are born with them. Again, a lot of these patients don't require any kind of treatment. Uh, majority of them do very well for the whole life. However, if patients are painful, we generally get a spec CT, which tells us if it is something which is uh, still active. Uh, and then these patients do very well with just putting a screw and bone graft. You don't even need to fuse these patients You know, when they're worried about that I will lose my level. It's just the parts defect, the lysis repair, which we do, and they do brilliantly well. Spondylolysis is again, is the lysis when it starts moving forward. The bone completely starts moving forward. These are the patients, when you see them in their OPD, they come with flexed hips and flexed knee. And unfortunately, these patients, when the listesis reduces, uh, uh, <clears throat> increases significantly, uh, when it starts slipping further, they do require some form of surgery. Now, when these patients, if they are picked up at an earlier stage, uh, the surgery becomes much easier to do with more better results then at a later stage, when they come like this with a completely, uh, the body is completely off, it's like a dislocation. Uh, trauma, in trauma, obviously, I'm just, there are, uh, in, in pediatric spine, trauma is one thing uh, which can cause majority of, uh, of your cervical spinal issues. Uh, C1, C2, C2, 3, etc. We see are very common. Uh, but this is, trauma is something which we do see referrals immediately. However, sometimes we do see this off patients who just complain of mild neck pain to start with. Uh, the family physician orders an x-ray, which is absolutely normal. Uh, they order an MRI also, which is, which is normal. Uh, and these are basically the spinal cord injuries without uh, any obvious radiological abnormalities, which we call a skivora. And this is what we, we need to you know, be very wary of. And these especially also sometimes happens in, in patients with, uh, if they come to us, they come to us with GCS3. So obviously we are going to do it. But I have seen really such patients who have been just conserved for a period of one month. And when we do a flexion extension x-ray, they start having uh, uh, instability at the C1, C2 level, which was aggravated. So it was something which was congenital. However, it did get aggravated because of the trauma. That's when they start developing symptoms. And then once we do a flexion extension x-ray, we see that, okay, there is something abnormal and then we need to do something about these patients. So skiwara is one thing we should, we should bear in mind. And last but not the least, obviously, are pediatric spinal tumors. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about these, but just one thing to remember is the red flags. Intractable pain, especially night pain. So night pain is something which we see very common, especially in this pediatric population, uh, GCTs, uh, osteo osteomas, all malignancies like Ebbing sarcoma, chondrosarcomas, etc., uh, are something which are rare, but obviously which need to be treated. Uh, again, if it's a benign tumor, majority of them get better. Uh, things like osteoid we do them endoscopically now, all with just RF radio frequency. Uh, however, if the tumor is malignant, uh, initially it was okay. This tumor is going to spread, and we can't do much about it. However, now with the advancement of navigation direct surgery, with the advancement of pedicle screws, these tumors are completely removed on block. On block means we take wide margins where we actually remove the whole vertebra. In fact, we have gone and removed up till four vertebras along with the intervening disc, along with the tumor in piecemeal. And if this tumor, this patient becomes tumor free, is going to save a lot for this patient because the chances of this recurring are very, very less than, uh, and the patient can have absolutely a normal life. Uh, in fact, I have uh, published a lot of papers on this and in major journals regarding, we've sort of gone up to four and five levels as well, four and five level on block spondylectomies for malignant tumors. Uh, we have a follow-up on almost four to five years of these patients as well now. Uh, this was with my, my mentor in Milan where we were just doing spinal tumors. Uh, and a lot of these patients uh, do fantastically well. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I, 
if the patient is coming to you along with the parents, I know initially it is a bit very because of the amount of questions we are saying, but just a basic history for the type of pain, the kind of pain, uh, the patient's symptoms and examination can actually tell you a lot about whether this is something which you need to refer to a specialist immediately or you at your level as well can just pacify the parents, give them basic painkillers or uh, muscle relaxants. So red flags, again, mild pain, since a few days only, no neurological deficits, probably you can try and treat those patients just by giving them uh, muscle relaxants, hot packs, etc. and they might do well. If you do think that they need to go for a specialist and or, or you want to get an x-ray done before, please always order a whole spine standing x-ray along with both the hips if required. Uh, I would say don't uh, do any more investigation in regards to these patients because we do see this very often when they come and say, okay, blood test was already done for my child. Why are you ordering more blood tests now? You know, my child is very scary about taking blood tests again and again, etc., etc. So if you have any doubt, I think just uh, leave the blood tests uh, to the specialists uh, and just st to start with an x-ray okay, uh, itself. Uh, look for the red flags. Uh, most important, I cannot emphasize more for this. Uh, and in the end, I think the most important is just to pacify the parents that it, it's going to be absolutely fine. And majority of these patients are, are, are going to be okay. And I'm just going to end this talk with one thing which the parents always ask us. Okay, is this because of the school bag? So you can please tell them that majority of the times it's not because of the school bag, but yes, it can be because of a school bag if the school bag is more than 12, 15 kilos. So they need to take care of that. Uh, but otherwise, it is not because of the school bag. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sambhav, for that uh, elaborate and wonderful talk. And hopefully you've cleared a lot of doubts and answered a lot of questions already. For, for people who have been with us or have currently joined us, now we can, we can take a few questions. Uh, so uh, just before uh, before anyone else asks, I'll just ask you a simple question. Sure. Like uh, uh, before, I mean, a lot of children have aches and pains and a lot of parents don't take them so seriously. Same with the back pain. So a lot of the times parents like, okay, the child has back pain. Yeah. So as a specialist, what would you recommend them as, as you've already told us the red flags, but most of them are more so in people who have other structural anomalies or other conditions. But in a regular kid, when should a parent get really worried and they should say, no, this is the high time you should have shown a specialist? See, if again, it all depends on the kind of symptoms the patient is coming with. So if a patient, if the mom tells me the patient is having back pain since two weeks, which is not reducing in intensity, uh, which is stopping him from doing his activities of daily living. So for an example, the parents say that he's not even going down to play, he or she. Or uh, they are telling us, uh, waking up in the night from pain. Now, these are the parents who I would definitely say, you know, we need to investigate. But at the same time, even if the pain is since two weeks, however, it's very on and off. Like for an example, we see, we see this very regularly that they say, okay, two, three days, he's absolutely fine. And on the fourth day, again, he has pain. So these are the kind of patients I would still wait. I would pass it, but okay, let's observe it for 10 more days. Probably tell him, take him swimming, try, start some physiotherapy, apply some heat packs, uh, keep an eye on him. Uh, but we, I, would, I would not even venture into going for an x-ray immediately if my examination is normal. Uh, a lot of these parents, I mean, the minute you tell them x-ray, they're very. If, if you do an x-ray and if it's normal, they again come back to you and say, Everything is normal. Unnecessary, I did an x-ray. Unnecessary, my child underwent radiation. Uh, so it, it gets very tricky when you're dealing with such parents. So it's a very gray zone. And that's why I cannot emphasize less. But I, I think for me, the most important is the history and the type of pain. That's my two key things. I absolutely agree with you. And I'd also like if you can tell some of our, some our family physicians, physicians is, one is you've already told us when to get an x-ray, but a lot of patients even to me come already with MRI scan when they might have not required it. Right. So as for you, can you tell our family physicians when should they actually ask for it or do they even need to ask for it? They should just directly send to a specialist. Yeah. So the, uh, the time when I would advise the family physician to ask for an x-ray is number one, if it's a case of deformity. So for example, if the patient is worried about scoliosis that my child is tinted to the right, and if you see them also, and if you feel, yes, they are tilting, which could also be a muscle spasm. 
uh, but the child wants something to be done. Now, say for an example, a family physician calls me, but for some reason tomorrow I'm not available. But the parents are very, very apprehensive. They can definitely order a whole spine standing X-ray. Safest bet. And for me also, it's it's one of the most valuable information. And the family physician will never go wrong if he orders this. So definitely you can order as long as it is a standing whole spine X-ray. So please just remember this. That if you feel the need for an X-ray, even though it turns out to be normal, it's absolutely fine. But the issue only happens when it's not a standing X-ray. They come to us, and then we need to reorder the X-ray. That's when you have to start answering a lot of questions. So, if you are worried that this child may have something two weeks pain, please go and order an X-ray to start with. Blood test, I would say no, because again, if there is an, the child has to undergo a repeat test, again, it's a problem. Yeah. Parents are wary. So, just a basic X-ray, standing whole spine. Is as as what you should be doing if you suspect anything in the spine. Would you recommend them to think about higher imaging, or would you tell them it's no. better to be? No, sent it's better. It's better for us to because again, imaging, including an MRI, also whether MRI needs contrast. So a lot of infection, tumors, etc. We require contrast imaging. Uh, a lot of cases we require stir imaging. Uh, a lot of times, what I would see, for example. Back pain patients. I've had so many patients who would, who would be referred to you because it turns out to be hip as a pathology. Now, if I'm examining the patient and if the rotations are a bit off, and I want to rule out the spine, I would still rule out, for example, parties. I would tell them to get an MRI scan done. So I think anything more than an X-ray, uh, it's better off that they are referred to the specialist, and then we can take a call on what needs to be done. And. Uh... Like even for simple back pain and things, like you've already told about the red flags and when our physicians need to send them, is there something from their side? How should they initially evaluate and treat, and what can they advise the families to prevent the at least the regular back pain, if not the other structural causes? What can they do to prevent so, it? So number one thing for advice, I think that um, again I cannot em uh, emphasize less on this. There is need to pacify the parents. There is nothing wrong. The, the best thing to do. So now a lot of uh, I've seen a family physician physician saying bed rest. Okay, bed rest is something which even for my adults patients I don't advise. Even if it's a 60 year old with a compression fracture, we don't advise bed rest. Even with a patient who is with tuberculosis, we don't advise bed rest because when we say the word bed rest, what happens is they're in bed, they're eating in bed, they're sleeping in bed, they're urinating in bed. Okay, which is which is not required when it comes to spine. The only indication for me in bed rest is if it's a very bad pathological fracture, the patient is unstable, fracture, and they don't want to go for surgery. Then I will tell them lie in bed for three months. Okay. Otherwise, we don't require bed rest. So one thing is that you don't need to tell them bed rest. You just need to tell them take it easy. This is the I think from my practice I have realized this is a very good word to tell them. Just take it easy in the sense that tell him not to overdo anything. If he's okay to read a book. It's fine if he's okay to even go down and cycle. It's fine if he thinks that while playing football, I'm getting pain. Don't do that. Okay, just absolutely take it easy. And at any point of time you feel there is a recurrent pain, then you call me immediately. But if the pain is getting better by the day, that means if tomorrow is better than today, day after tomorrow is better than tomorrow, we are going in the right direction. But if after I give you medications also the pain comes back to the same intensity, then you need to come back to me for further investigation. So mild physio, gentle physio, mild uh, mild activities to be continued is absolutely the way they should be advising. The other thing is like, can you uh, tell uh, tell our family physicians about a certain age limit? Like, would you be more worried if the back pain is in a child who's less than ten years or less than five years than someone yeah. who's more? So as I said in the presentation also that. Anything below five, if they come with severe back pain, it would be a complete red flag. And they are picked up much earlier. So a three-year-old, the parents pick up that, okay, he's crying for some reason. They might not want the back. But they will tell me, okay, the minute I put him to lie down, he's getting pain. The minute I, I, I comfort him or I support him, the pain, he feels better. Okay, so a lot of these things. But in general, anyone below five, I would immediately send them to a specialist. The issue comes when, and I think a lot of times we see these patients directly also, okay, because the parents are directly googling them. It's the patients who are mainly in the age group of eight and above, whose pains are not that bad, you know, on and off back pain or recurrent back pain that they had back pain a month ago, they got fine, and now they have more 
back pain has come back again, which are again more related to posture, D3, B12, etc. So again, as a family physician, if the patient is coming to with mild back pain, I think there is no harm also the patient has not taken D3, B12. You could probably offer them that uh, even without an x-ray. Just tell them to exercise, take care of their postures. Again, advise them regarding their mobile phones, Zoom calls, and uh, especially in COVID times now, Zoom meetings. So majority of these kids are on the laptop, etc. So just, uh, just advise them regarding reducing the screen time, etc. And I think they should be fine. The other thing, like as you said in your talk as well, like the age group 10 to 15, we see a lot of children who have these non-specific backaches. And even I have seen that they've end up uh, turning out to be tuberculosis at some point. Yes. Is there any more uh, clinical signs or something that you can help our clinical physicians to help us pick these children early? Because the earlier you treat them, it's just medical treatment. The later they come to us, we end up having surgical reconstruction. See, I mean, majority of the constitutional symptoms which are with tuberculosis, like weight loss, appetite, fever, etc., if they're complaining, I think it will be a red flag for everyone uh, with regards to uh, a family physician or any specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, but just from the point of view of the pain, so if it's a pain which is lasting for more than two weeks, not improving in the intensity. So if even the intensity is not worsening, but it is the same intensity lasting for more than two weeks, and the patient is still getting the same kind of pain while doing the same kind of activities, it's a red flag also. I think they should go in for an x-ray or for a MRI eventually. Uh, at the same patient improving, you can wait and watch. So we've seen tuberculosis, they improve initially with analgesics. Yes. The minute you stop the analgesics, they're back to pain. Again, of the same intensity. So again, I would definitely then go in for an x-ray or some form of investigation for this patient. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Sambhav, for your firstly great talk and then answering all our questions. And hopefully you've cleared a lot of doubts and simply the, uh, the most commonly asked question. Uh, yes, uh, Sonu ma'am has a yeah. question. <laughs> uh, any truth in the myth that hard bed, soft bed, this pillow, that pillow, or is it that uh, what suits a person or what suits a child should be? So you I know, think, grandmothers say because yeah, you made yeah, him sleep yeah. in a soft bed, now yeah. he's got a curved back and massage nahi kiya, iske liye kharab ho gaya. Definitely. So uh, it's a fantastic question because it's something, again, which we very often see more in the adult population. Uh, but in general, again, you will find a lot of information, even if you Google, it's varied completely. But it's something which I have learned from my bosses as well. My experience is that, first of all, pillows, beds, etc. Are, are obviously human-made. They're man-made. We were actually supposed to be sleeping on a flat surface. So when you lie down on, a, say, a flat floor, you will see that there are two points which touch the floor. One is the posterior protuberance of your head and the mid-region of your scapula. These are the two points which are actually touching the floor. So if you have a pillow, which is firm. It does not need to be uh, very uh, height. It should be just thin enough, but not but firm, where you don't sink your head in. So if it is firm, but the pillow, when it spans from above your head till below your mid-scapular region, then your neck is in the neutral alignment as it would be without a pillow. Okay, That would be the best pillow for anyone. Yes, if you're lying down on, a, uh, on your bed, if you're not using a pillow, that would be the best. But none of us are comfortable with that. So yeah. None of us are comfortable. So, for an example, when you go to hotels, they give you the soft pillows. They, 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 they put two or three pillows on top of it. They are the worst for your neck and your back. And majority of patients, especially adult patients, they'll come and say, I had a long trip, business trip. Now I have significant neck and back pain. It's because of the hotel pillows. Okay. So anything which is thin, which is firm and which spans from above your head till your mid scapula is a good pillow to have. Similarly, a bed which is firm, where you sit on the bed, you should not sink in. It doesn't mean it has to be hard like a rock, but you get these really good mattresses now which are firm. So, so that's what I emphasize on the word firm, where you don't sink in, it should be good. Yeah. Actually, uh, neck pain has become increased, uh, is increasing in incidence, especially in age group from 10 to 15. Definitely. Yeah, One is because of cell phones, uh, 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 watching TV or they're on their laptops and the posture they keep their neck in. So the pillows, which Sambhav said is, 
usually they don't need very high fi treatment simple things like pillow and changing things can just help them out quite a bit and just to uh, thank you for bringing up this point but one more thing which i've just realized which you also you can keep in mind is so you asked one question to your uh, to the parents that is a child very hyper in the sense a lot of uh, kids they are sleeping on one side of the bed and in the morning they are on the other side of the bed and we have seen that these kids actually they sleep in very bad positions because they they, they shift a lot Uh, so the neck is in one part of the bed and the legs are in the other part of the bed, uh, and we have seen that a lot of these children complain of neck pain. And once what we just tell them to do is you put pillows on both the sides so that move motion is restricted, and that really helps a lot. Uh, Doctor Sambhav, I had a question similar to Madam's. So we are having a lot of adults and now children spending hours over their laptop, you know, uh, hunched over their laptops. So I had a question regarding. like getting an ergonomic chair for a child so um this is like a ch- child with no neuromuscular problems so what do you recommend i mean no fancy chairs but what do you recommend like basic things that need to be taken care of you know like lower back support or shoulder support and what should be the height of the you know so your screen you. and yeah. how you're sitting if you can just comment on that sure but i mean i just feel that it's so sad that we need to talk about uh, the type of chair for children because i, I think when we were growing up we, we never cared about these things but it is a it is a sad truth uh however what i recommend is you know the old i think sonu madam would be seconding the, the old parsi chair which is 90 90 90 wooden chair it is one of the best chairs ever you know the, you get chairs with this lumbar uh, uh support and yeah. a chair which go, okay. they are all horrible the chair which is nine straight 90 and then 90 with your hand support on the side Okay, they are one of the best chairs. Now yeah, you give them cushion. You put your slight cushioning in that just to keep it soft. But when you sit on these chairs and when your your gluteal, your gluteal region is touching the back of the chair, your spine will remain straight. What happens is when you take these lumbar support chairs, your spine starts arching further. So for the kids it would be okay, but for adults they start developing facet joint pain. because the facet joint gets arched and it's under a lot of stress so they start developing back pain there so a straight chair 1990 old school wooden chair is one of the best chairs which i recommend no one makes them now because everyone wants fancy chairs exactly exactly you never realize those chester fields where you sat with your arms like that yes yes exactly so where your arms are rested your hands your keyboard is 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 at the level of your yeah exactly exactly the other thing some of i get regularly asked by a lot of parents when they come to me for especially as you spoke about school and the school bag uh, after the whole question they ask me should we change a school bag what is the best school bag and we have a 15 minute conversation just on the type of school yes. bag so do you think it makes a difference or is there any important point about it it, it? Uh, it does make a difference in the kind of schools again initially we see this more often now actually i don't see that much school bags because a lot of things have moved to laptops and other things even in the school you know the children have the laptops etc so we don't see this very often but still because of the myth in the past the question is still there but majority of the patients now especially in today's times i think school bags are their school bags are not that heavy uh yes uh i have seen this more often in kids who are for example going for the football practice in the morning or cricket practice in the morning so where they, they are carrying the cricket kits along with their school bags and then they are talking of uh, things so in general i tell them that weight point of view ideally anyone above the age of 10 should not be carrying anything more than 5 to 7 kilos on their back that to have a sack would be good a lot of kids now just for the fashion statement they carry carry it up a belt across you know bag is lying on one side or the back across just one shoulder i think our old have a sacks which are you know they they coming in the front both sides equally uh, the load is shifted they are one of the best bags so that is what i would definitely advise them to do stick to the old school haver sack are there any more questions um okay. i think there are two questions but uh, not related to today's uh, topic one is on elbow pain and spina bifida management i think for these questions they can reach out to our orthopedic team anytime and i think these questions will be answered Okay. Uh, before, yeah, yeah, you want to say anything? Uh, I am getting three, four questions on my SMS. Okay. From a few doctors. 
So uh, should I take them or how do we? Get yeah, them? take take them. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the questions uh, one doctor has messaged me is, uh, do we need to send these patients for scoliosis screening? Uh, uh, so uh, yes, I think uh, any patients above the age of nine or ten, if the parents have any doubt or even if not, in fact at at uh, SRCC we are starting a scoliosis screening. Uh, clinic dedicated just for scoliosis screening uh, which hopefully will start soon once the covid situation gets better which are going to be on saturday the advantage of scoliosis screening as i said is is that the child children are picked up at much earlier stage and if we are able to stop the progression of the curve just by simple bracing uh, it saves a lot for these patients uh, so in fact we are even going to try and get into schools where uh, we are going to start this scoliosis screening program so if a parent uh, is uh, wants to get checked just for scoliosis screening, please do. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. Yeah, Dr. Rasa, you can, you can go ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> good afternoon, friends. We have completed four months of masterclass for family physician. We started in first week of uh, June. So today is the fourth month is completed. And we have kept on changing as per uh, uh, what we felt appropriate. So initially, we could not get MMC points, but now we can get the MMC points. <clears throat> but for, for MMC point, the requirement is we have to have class for three hours. So we are going to modify our class now. So our next class will be on 21st October. We will have three lectures one after another, which will be 2.30 to 5.30, three lectures, one hour each. And uh, we will have MMC points for that. Everybody will have to log on to Zoom uh, and sign in so that we have time when you sign in and when you get out, the time will be there. So we can send you the certificate later on by email. Uh, so this will be the change. So uh, that was one part. The second part, the SRCC Children's Hospital is running almost normally. We have all OPDs which are open, as well as the operating room uh, work has almost reached to like pre-COVID era. So we are functioning maybe at 80 to 90% uh, for last 15 days. So if you have any patients who needs any child, who needs any, any kind of care, uh, the SRCC is working fully. And we are not on panel for COVID, so we hardly have any COVID patient most of the time. So our next class will be on 21st October uh, 2020, Wednesday, 2.30 to 5.30. Again, thank you, Sambha, for excellent lecture. And thank we you. learned a lot. And uh, same thing from family physician also. Very good attendance thank also. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Are we as well as Pooja for good moderation of the session? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.